Imagine discovering a huge gold reserve only to encounter a strange being and then teleported into another planet. That is the storyline of this intriguing and entertaining sci-fi slash action movie, John Carter. Enjoy the recap. We see a man darting through the throng of people, his eyes drifting left and right. He knew he was being followed, but he couldn't shake off his pursuer. He had to get to the telegraph office before it was too late. He pushed his way into the building and handed a slip of paper to the clerk. He paid extra to send the telegram express. The clerk nodded and took the paper. It was addressed to a young man named Ned who received the urgent telegram and hurried to see his uncle. He was worried and quite confused. He had never met his uncle, who had been away on some mysterious adventure for years. He packed his bags and boarded a train to his uncle's estate. There, he was greeted by a lawyer who informed him that his uncle had died suddenly and left him everything. He handed him a leather-bound diary and said, This is his last will and testament. He wanted you to read it and learn the truth about his life. The young man thanked the lawyer then began to read. The story begins in Arizona, after the Civil War. John Carter, a decorated former captain in the Confederate Army, is searching for gold. The locals don't seem to like him. Colonel Powell of the cavalry tries to press Carter into service to fight the Apache. Carter refuses to cooperate, and after several failed escape attempts, he tricks a cell guard, knocks him out, and escapes Fort Grant on Colonel Powell's horse. Powell and the rest of the cavalry give chase but are forced to halt when they see that Carter has met up with a mounted Apache warband. Both sides are armed and wary, and a language barrier increases the tension. Soon a gunfight breaks out. Carter takes the chance to run off, but Colonel Powell is shot, and Carter returns to retrieve the injured man. Carter and Powell ran for their lives, pursued by the Apache warriors. They found a narrow canyon with a hidden cave and hoped to lose their trackers there. But as they entered the cave, they saw the Apache stop and retreat, as if scared by something. Carter was puzzled and curious. He went back to the mouth of the cave and saw a spider-like symbol carved on the rock above. He decided to explore the cave further, leaving Powell at the entrance. He soon discovered a chamber full of gold and strange writings. He was mesmerized by the sight, but he did not notice the figure that appeared behind him wearing a shiny robe. A knife that glowed blue appeared on his hand. Powell shouted a warning, but it was too late. Carter had to fight for his life against the mysterious being. He managed to shoot him and grab his knife and medallion. He heard him utter some words and repeated them instinctively. Then everything went black. When he opened his eyes, he was in a different world. A barren desert stretched before him, under a sky with two moons. He tried to stand up, but he felt lighter than usual. He realized he could jump higher and farther than on Earth. He was amazed by this new ability, but he also felt lost and alone. He climbed a nearby hill and saw a nest of eggs that hatched into green creatures with six limbs. He was disgusted by them and wanted to leave, but then he saw another group of green beings coming his way. They were riding on huge animals and carrying guns. They shot at him, but one of them ordered them to stop. He was a tall green man with four arms and a fierce expression. He spoke to Carter in a language he did not understand, but they managed to exchange their names. He was Tars Tarkas, the Jeddak of his tribe. He seemed interested in Carter's jumping skill and asked him to demonstrate it again. Carter saw an opportunity to reach Tarkas' weapons, but he was quickly surrounded and captured. Carter watched helplessly as Tarkas dismissed his warriors and ordered them to spare his life. He felt a surge of panic as he saw them gather the green hatchlings and smash the remaining eggs. He realized that he was in a strange and hostile world, and that his only hope of returning to Earth was the medallion that Tarkas had taken from him and worn around his neck. He was dragged along by the Tharks to their city, a crumbling relic of a forgotten civilization. There, he was treated with scorn and curiosity by the alien creatures. They did not know what he was, and his inability to communicate made him seem like a dumb beast or an infant. He was thrown into a pit with the other hatchlings, where he met Sola, a female Thark who was shunned by her peers, especially by a cruel female named Sarkoja. Sola gave him a drink that miraculously enabled him to speak and understand their language. Meanwhile, in another part of the planet, a fierce battle raged between two factions of humanoids. They fought on flying ships, one blue and one red. On the red ship, three mysterious bald figures appeared and offered Prince Sab then a gift from the goddess, a blue device that granted him the power to shoot bolts of energy. Sab then tried to use it against them, but he was repelled by their own force. The figures laughed. They were Thurns, emissaries of the goddess, and they had chosen to ally with Prince Sab then of Zodanga in this war. We see Dejah Thoris, a princess of Helium waiting to present her discovery to her father. It was a machine that could harness the Ninth Ray, a mysterious force that gave Zodanga, their enemy, an edge in the war. She hoped to convince her father, Tardos Morse, the Jeddak of Helium, to support her research and use the Ninth Ray for good. When he arrived, Dejah showed him her discovery. The group was amazed by her demonstration, but one of them, a Thern in disguise, secretly sabotaged the machine with a small device. 
DJI was frustrated. Tardos Moores thanked his daughter for her efforts, but said that they had no time to waste on experiments. DJ would marry Sabvan, the Prince of Zodanga, as part of a peace treaty. He said that it was the only way to stop the bloodshed and save their civilization. DJ was shocked and heartbroken. She knew that Sabvan was a cruel and ambitious man who would not honor his word. She was helpless. Meanwhile, John Carter was trying to escape from his captors. He still hasn't gotten the medallion, the mysterious artifact that had brought him to this strange world from Earth. He needed to find it and return home. He had a dog-like creature, Wula, watching over him. As he jumped, Wula disrupted the Thark gathering, and they beat him up. Carter intervened and killed a Thark with one blow. They were impressed by Carter's strength and agility, but they were also furious at his insolence and violence. They dragged Carter and Wula away from the scene. They blamed Sola because she had been assigned as Carter's guardian and translator. They said that she had failed to control him and keep him in line. They decided to punish Sola by branding her with hot iron on her skin. They said that she had committed too many offenses already and that she had no more space for new marks. They also told her that if she made another mistake, they would have to kill her. Carter watched in horror as they burned Sola's flesh. He felt guilty and angry. He wanted to help her, but he was powerless. He wondered if he would ever find his medallion and escape from this nightmare. The Tharks had to take cover behind the rocks as a sentry alerts them of approaching airships. They look up and see three massive vessels soaring in the sky, engaged in a fierce battle. Two of them bear the red flags of Zodanga, the enemy of all Barsoomians, while the other one flies the blue flag of Helium, the city of art and culture. The Zodangan ships are trying to board the Heliumite ship, but they are captured and sab their searches for the princess. Tars Tarkas, the leader of the Tharks, observes the scene with a telescope and explains to Carter the history of the war between Zodanga and Helium. He tells him how Zodanga is a ruthless and greedy nation that seeks to conquer and plunder all other cities on Barsum. On the Heliumite ship, the Princess Dejathoris is trying to escape. She manages to gain access to one of the ships and attempts to fly away. But the airship crashed into another and she fell over the edge. She was hanging on for dear life when Carter sees her and is amazed that she is human. This is the first time he is seeing another human since he arrived in this strange place. He feels a sudden urge to save her and uses his incredible jumping ability to leap from one ship to another. He reaches DJ and pulls her up, but they are soon surrounded by Zodangan soldiers. Carter fights them off with DJ's sword, however. DJ also proves to be a skilled fighter when she retrieves her sword. Together, they manage to turn the tide of the battle. Carter then gains access to one of the airships and shoots the Zodangan ship causing it to crash to the ground. However, when Tharks saw that Sabler had captured Carter, they shot at him and successfully freed Carter. Tars Tarkas had witnessed Carter's heroic deeds and was impressed by his courage and strength. He decides to make him his Dodor Sojut, or right arm, and gives him Dejathoris as a reward. This angers Talhages, a rival Thark with a broken tusk, who wanted to usurp power from Tars Tarkas. Carter is not interested in becoming a Thark or owning Dej as a prize. He only wants to return to his home planet. He tries to explain this to Dej, but she does not believe him. She thinks he is either mad or lying. He described a world that is green and blue, with oceans and forests, something that Barsum has not seen for millennia. She suspects he is a Thern. They talk about astronomy and realize that they are from different planets, Carter from Earth or Jasum, and DJ from Mars or Barsum. Later that night, Carter, DJ Thoris, and Sola ventured into the Forbidden Cave, hoping to find clues about the interdimensional travel that the Therns, the worshippers of the goddess, might possess. As they explored the dark passages, DJ Thoris deciphered some ancient inscriptions on the walls, but their curiosity was cut short by the arrival of the Tharks, who arrested them for violating the sacred temple. However, Tarkas helped them escape from the prison. He didn't want the Tharks to kill Sola. He also gave Carter the medallion. The trio continued their journey to the river ISS, following the medallion that Tarkas gave to Carter. Sola warned Carter that DJ Thoris was not being honest with him and that she had ulterior motives for going to the river. Carter confronted DJ Thoris and she confessed that she was actually the Princess of Helium, a city-state at war with Zodanga, and that she had hoped to reach her home and use Carter as a weapon against her enemies. She also revealed that she was betrothed to the Prince of Zodanga, who might kill her after their wedding. Carter was furious and felt betrayed by DJ Thoris, but he also felt sympathy for her plight. He decided to give her a chance and agreed to go to the River ISS first, before making any decisions about his future. The River ISS was a place of pilgrimage for those who sought salvation from their sins or their old age. They believed that by following the river, they would reach the paradise of the goddess. Sola was tempted to join them when she saw some of her fellow Tharks sailing away on boats, but Carter stopped her and reminded her of their mission. They reached a huge pyramid-shaped structure that rose from the water. Carter and DJ Thoris entered it and found a room full of blue lights and holograms that depicted the solar system. 
Dejah Thoris realized that the blue light was not a divine power, but a scientific phenomenon, the Ninth Ray, the same ray that she had been studying and that Zodanga had been using as a weapon. Carter soon suspected that they were no longer alone. So they went outside and when they looked around, they saw the green-skinned Tharks closing in on them, led by Matai Shan. He knew he had to protect Dejah Thoris and Sola, the two women who had become his friends in this strange world. He urged them to ride away on their mounts, while he stayed behind with his loyal companion, Wula. He faced the horde of enemies with courage, but also with a pang of sadness. He remembered how he had lost his family in a war on Earth, and how he had sworn never to fight again. But fate had brought him to Mars, where he had found a new cause. He fought valiantly, killing many Tharks. But he was outnumbered and wounded, and soon he fell to the ground. Then, Helium airships arrived and shot at the green Tharks, dispersing them. Sabther was with the King of Helium when they arrived. The king tells his daughter that Sabthar had come to make peace with Helium. Carter was eventually taken to Zodanga, the Sabthar city, where he was kept in a room with guards. When he woke, he wondered how he had ended up there, and what had happened to Dejah Thoris. He hoped she was safe, and that she would change her mind about marrying Sabthar. He heard a voice outside the door, and saw a man in blue enter. He recognized him as Kantos Kan, a captain of Helium. Kantos Kan told him he was in Zodanga, and that he had come to rescue him. He asked Carter to pretend to be his hostage, so they could escape together. Carter was confused. So, Kandos can grabbed him by the arm and acted as though Carter held him captive. They both went outside the room. He asked Carter if he could jump onto a tower building just as the guards started coming after them. Carter made the jump to the tower and there, they found DJ in a room wearing a magnificent dress. She thanked Kandos for bringing him to her and sent away the servants. She begged him to stay with her and fight for her people, but he refused. She saw the ring he wore and understood he had lost another woman he loved. She eventually gives him the medallion and tells him the words that would send him back to his world, wishing him happiness. He was reluctant to leave even as they heard the Zodangan soldiers knocking on the door. He recited the words then he disappeared. Sabdar and his men entered the room but they found only Dee Jathoris there. She was heartbroken that Carter had finally left. She hid her expressions and left with them, followed by an old woman who was part of those guarding the room. She came back and looked around sensing Carter was still around. He was actually hiding in the ceiling, and the old lady catches him with a blue beam and reveals herself as Matai Shang, the master of the Therns. He pulled him along and told him how the Therns were behind the destruction of Mars. They were trapped in a crowd of Zodangans who were celebrating the marriage of Dejah Thoris and Sabvan. Matai Shang changed his face to a Zodangan officer and took him outside. He then turned into an old woman again and casually told him that Dejah Thoris and everyone who knew about the Ninth Ray would die after the wedding. Carter tried to call Dejah Thoris when he saw her, but Matai Shang had control over his voice, so he couldn't be heard by anyone. Later on, Carter's loyal beast Wula came to save him, biting off Matai Shang's device and freeing him. He jumped on a flying machine and flew away, chased by Zodangan ships. He escaped them and landed near Sola, who shot down the Zodangan ship after him. Carter knew he could not fight the Zodangans and the Therns by himself, so he decided to go back to the city of the Tharks and ask for their help. He and Sola got there safely, but they were captured by the Tharks and locked in a cell. There he saw Tars Tarkas, his old friend, chained and bruised. Tars Tarkas told him that he had been dethroned by Tal Hages, the cruel Thark. Tarkas is furious when he learns that Carter brought Sola back, and would have killed him were it not for the fact that he had been beaten and drastically weakened. The prisoners are then taken to a large coliseum and made to fight each other first, then against a pair of giant white apes. Sola causes a distraction in the stands, which allows Carter to kill one then later on, the second beast. As the Tharks cheer for him, he challenges Tal Hages for the role of Jeddak. Carter beheads him with one neat stroke. Now the Jeddak of the Tharks, he has an army willing to fight for him. He leads them back to Zodanga to stop the wedding. On arrival they find the city empty, everyone is gone to Helium. An unimpressed Tars Tarkas slaps Carter upside the head, since there is no way they can make it to the wedding in time. Carter points to the airships but the Tharks refuse. He had to go on by himself on the airship. Zodangan guards spot him as he approaches, but since he's flying a Zondangan aircraft, they assume he's part of their plan and let him pass. As the wedding ceremony is about to finish, Carter crashes in. Dejah Thoris is thrilled to see him, but it is too late as the signal has been cast. Zodangans begin attacking the Heliumites, and once again Matai Shang and his blue ray seem unstoppable. Suddenly a huge light cruiser crashes in two, and the Tharks disembark to follow their leader. They join the Heliumite army and fight off the Zodangans. Matai Shang escapes but Carter recovers the medallion. During the fight, Sabdan is killed by the blue device he was using in his fights. Carter felt a surge of relief as the immediate threat of Zodanga had been eliminated. He knew where his heart was, and he was going to marry Dija. Dija was overjoyed when Carter asked her to marry him. She had loved him from the moment they had met, and she knew that he was the one for her. 
They were married in a grand ceremony, and both Helium and Thark rejoiced. That night, Carter was restless. He stepped out of the room and tossed the medallion into the canyon below. As he returned to the bedchamber, one of the guards greeted him, but then suddenly reached out and grabbed him. The guards soon transformed into Matai Shang, the leader of the Therns who had come to capture Carter. Shang transported Carter back to the cave in Arizona from where he had arrived on Mars. Carter awoke stiff, dusty, and bearded. The colonel was but a skeleton, and the gold and the Thern body were gone. Carter knew that there must be other Therns on Earth, and he spent the next ten years looking for another medallion. It appears he found the medallion in the Orkneys. He also prepared a crypt on his estate so that he could return to Mars and leave his body safe on Earth. He entrusted his nephew Edgar with keeping him safe, knowing that the Therns would likely attack his body at the moment when Edgar was reading his journal. Horrified, Edgar ran to check the crypt. He didn't know that he was being followed. After a few tense seconds, he figured out the password and opened the door, but the crypt was empty. A Thern appeared behind Edgar and was about to kill him, but it was shot dead. Edgar turned around to see Carter outside holding a gun. Carter explained that he had taken a drug that made it appear that he was dead. He never really found the medallion, he had just used Edgar as bait to draw out a Thern and enable him to obtain the medallion he needed to go back to DJ Thoris. Edgar was relieved to be alive, but he was also confused. He didn't understand why Carter would put him in such danger. Carter explained that Edgar had a very important role to play, protector of Carter's body on Earth as he returned to his true home, on Mars. He bid him farewell and entrusted everything to his hands. Taking the medallion from the dead Thern, Carter went into the crypt, laid down, and recited the phrase to return to. Barso, if you enjoyed this recap, do subscribe to the channel and turn on the notifications to know when the next video drops. Also like and drop a comment on the video. You can check out other videos already on the channel. Until next time, stay safe.